Hello and welcome to this video on weaponized lasers. We're going to be covering um, first the advantages and disadvantages of lasers, what makes them attractive, why the military is pursuing them, as well as going through some history of laser development, and then talking a bit about current efforts designed to bring weaponized lasers to the battlefield. But before we get into it, a few quick things. First of all, apologies um, that there's not too much visual content uh, in this video. There aren't that many videos and images um, in the public domain of laser weapons. So there wasn't much for me to work with. You might um, have the best results not really watching this, but rather listening to it as more of a podcast, um, although there are some images. And second of all, I am not a physicist or a laser engineer, but I have consulted many sources and been following the development of lasers for uh, many years now. And um, I will link some of the best resources that I used in my research and in the making of this video below if you would like to read those as well. So, for starters, a weaponized laser is a type of directed energy weapon. As opposed to a normal weapon like a gun, which achieves its effect on the target through imparting kinetic energy to a bullet which then impacts the target and damages it a directed energy weapon directly fires if you will the energy itself at the target there are other types of directed energy weapons including microwave weapons um, and some others but this video is going to focus just on lasers and basically a laser is a weaponized laser is a directed energy weapon which operates um, from the UV, the ultraviolet, to the infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this includes visible light, but most uh, weaponized lasers, actually all weaponized lasers, do not operate in the visible part of the spectrum. Most of them are in the infrared, um, somewhere in the infrared. And they work basically by burning the target, um, essentially. They impart a massive amount of heat on a very small area, ideally, um, on the target, which basically burns through it. So I'm going to show some footage of the LAWS uh, laser weapon fielded by the Navy aboard USS Ponce undergoing some testing while I talk about some of the advantages of laser weapons. So probably the biggest benefit is that energy is your ammunition for a laser weapon. Um, normally, if you're using a missile to destroy something, missiles tend to cost tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, some even millions of dollars. If you can use a laser to destroy that same target, you're saving a ton of money, which is especially important if the target is something cheap like a drone. Another benefit, of course, is magazine depth, and this is a related thing. A ship, for example, can only carry so many missiles to defend itself with. Same is true for an aircraft, same is true for a surface-to-air missile system, etc. You can carry much more fuel and power much, many more laser shots than you ever could by just carrying surface-to-air missiles, for example. So, laser weapons could potentially allow you to defend against a big swarm of incoming targets without running out of ammunition. Another major advantage of lasers is the instantaneous travel time. Unlike gunfire, which has to be compensated for the, for the lead of the target, or missiles which have to be guided, the laser beam travels at the speed of light, which is, you know, for normal purposes, instantaneous. So all you have to be able to do is to aim, you know, the laser at the target and focus the beam on one specific spot. But you don't need to worry about any sort of guidance or any sort of lag between the laser beam and the target, which is very helpful when you're engaging targets that might be maneuvering, traveling very quickly, or small targets. It's very hard to hit something like a small commercial drone with gunfire, but it's much easier to hit it with a laser weapon which can easily be slewed and focus in on the target. Another benefit is the ability to scale your response with a laser. So in many lasers you can dial up the power as necessary. So on a low power mode a laser might just dazzle the sensors of the target. But if the target continues to attack, you can scale up the response perhaps by, you know, beginning to melt off a wing or whatnot. So the ability to kind of have a graduated response can be really beneficial when the rules of engagement are murky or unclear, as opposed to a surface-to-air missile or gunfire, which will simply destroy the target once it's fired. 
However, there are many disadvantages to laser weapons, and there are many reasons that they may never um, achieve the success that some envision for them. So the first and most obvious one is power. A laser weapon, to be effective in the roles that currently are reserved for high-end um, air-to-surface missiles, surface-to-air missiles, air-to-air missiles, etc., if you wanted to replace those missiles with a laser, it would need to be very powerful. This chart shows, um, it compiles various estimates from different reports as to how much power you would need for specific types of engagements. So as you can see, for attacking high-end targets like ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, etc., most of the ports envision needing at least 500 kilowatts. If anything, that's probably optimistic. Many believe that you would only really be able to use a laser against missiles effectively if the laser was in the megawatt range. And currently, lasers simply aren't there yet. Um, at least not the types of lasers that are being considered for battlefield deployment, which is something we'll talk about later. Another related issue is the effects of the atmosphere on attenuating the laser beam. So, in completely clear conditions high in the atmosphere, lasers can work pretty well, but in real-world um, atmospheric conditions, there are many factors that can degrade the performance of the laser. So, first of all, any sort of dust or particulates in the air will naturally, you know, have the effect of diminishing the power of the laser that reaches the target. Another issue is, um, is humidity and water vapor. Water vapor also acts kind of as it attenuates the laser beam and makes it more diffuse. This is especially problematic when using lasers um, on a surface ship, for example, because the ocean spray is naturally going to cause a lot of, you know, water particles to be in the air, which complicates um, the travel of the laser beam through the atmosphere. And one of the biggest issues uh, is thermal bloom. So basically thermal bloom describes the effect of atmospheric heating when you fire a very high energy laser through the air. So at over approximately 100 kilowatts and above, the laser itself is so powerful that it actually heats the air it travels through, which causes, you know, expanding the air causes it to kind of diffract the laser beam and it causes the laser beam to lose focus. And it's always important to have your laser beam be focused because the smaller area you're concentrating energy on, the more quickly it can burn through the skin of whatever you're targeting. So any sort of atmospheric imperfections that cause your laser beam to scatter are going to reduce its ability to cut through the target. Another source of imperfections is simple turbulence that occurs, especially near the surface of the Earth as air naturally passes over, you know, obstacles and whatnot, the air becomes turbulent. Um, and turbulence, even though it's not visible to us, turbulence does attenuate the laser beam as it passes through and cause issues. Some of these atmospheric effects can actually be compensated for with adaptive optics that basically kind of predict what sort of turbulence the laser beam is going to encounter and like corrects it preemptively. But thermal bloom, unfortunately, for laser weapons um, is not possible to overcome with adaptive optics. You could attempt to overcome thermal bloom by having multiple lower power lasers converge on the same spot but not take the same path, um, which is something that I think has been explored. Another big question regarding the effectiveness of laser weapons is countermeasures. Theoretically, anything that increases the ability of the target to handle heat would reduce the effectiveness of a laser weapon. So this could be as simple as, you know, some sort of ceramic plating or whatnot. Um, there is some research being done into reflective surfaces as well, although a simple mirror made of metal, for example, is not going to be effective against a laser hundreds of kilowatts in power. And in fact, uh, MDBA did a trial which found that a mirror provided no additional protection because any tiny bits of dust or imperfection in the mirror are just going to get burnt very quickly and the mirror will reduce, uh, will lose its reflective property. But some uh, more exotic types of reflections, such as dielectric mirrors, which are basically tuned to reflect, have a very high reflectiveness in a very specific um, wavelength, 
do uh, have more promise for um, a countermeasure against laser weapons. And there are also some other um, topics of inquiry, such as ablative surfaces, which would basically absorb the energy of the laser beam and kind of use it to, t to create a gas. So the surface would be like a sacrificial coating that would, you know, um, basically dissipate the energy of the laser. So, but these are very exotic examples. Some existing weapons, such as hypersonic glide vehicles and ICBM reentry vehicles, etc., are already fairly well hardened against laser weapons because these are designed to handle huge amounts of heat in their normal flight. Um, anything that goes hypersonic already has highly temperature resistant skin that allows it to fly through the air at hypersonic speeds. So the additional heat from a laser is going to mean much less to, a to this type of weapon, um, which makes them more challenging to intercept. And for this reason, Laser weapon development has primarily been focused on softer skin targets. So this could be, you know, a cruise missile, for example, which isn't designed to handle the same type of heat as something like a, a ICBM reentry vehicle or a ballistic missile reentry vehicle. Um, it could also mean targeting ballistic missiles in the boost phase, so that you can burn off their thinner skinned booster uh, rather than having to target the reentry vehicle. And of course, things like aircraft and drones tend to have relatively soft skin. But there is the question of, if laser weapons were to proliferate, could relatively simple hardening make it exponentially more difficult to burn through these types of targets? Another important consideration is that laser weapons always need a line of sight, which means that a laser weapon located close to the Earth's surface will be limited, if applicable, by mountains nearby, um, you know, structures, trees, etc., but also, a laser weapon mounted aboard a ship will be limited by the Earth's curvature, which means that realistically you're only going to be able to engage a low-flying target at something like 10, you know, 15 miles once they cross the horizon line, whereas some current surface-to-air missiles can conduct engagements much further than that if the target is detected, although of course radar is also limited by a line of sight. Um, at least the types of radars used to detect sea skimmers. So whether or not that's a relevant consideration kind of depends on the circumstances. And of course, relying on a line of sight also means that a laser could be blocked by a ship superstructure, for example. So to achieve full 360 degree coverage, if there's something obstructing, you may need two lasers. It's also worth noting that a laser can only engage one target at a time, of course. It only produces one beam, and the beams can't be split and whatnot, so you can only engage one target at a time. This means that you could be overcome by a swarm attack if you take too long to engage each target and if you can't slew the laser quickly enough. So we may think of lasers as something that operates quickly, but there have been lower power lasers in tests that take many seconds to burn through a target. And if you're facing a swarm of dozens of drones, for example, that pop up over the horizon very quickly, um, and your laser takes too long to burn through them and too long to slew from one target to the next, you could find yourself overcome. So depending on how quick the targets income uh, are incoming, depending on the range of your laser and many other considerations, it may be problematic that the laser can only engage one target at a given time. And then, of course, there's the issue of power. Virtually all modern laser weapons are electrically operated rather than chemically operated, so they need to be supplied with enough electrical power to be able to fire. And for a large laser that's designed to engage high-end targets, this is a pretty heavy burden to impose on the power delivery and generation system of the host platform. So this basically restricts the highest power lasers to, you know, large platforms with a lot of power generation capability, such as a large aircraft, a ship, or, you know, a very large truck with a lot of generators and um, power storage mounted to it. All right, now that we've discussed some basics of laser weapon characteristics, um, advantages and disadvantages, let's talk a bit about the history of laser uh, weapon development. So, laser weapon development really be began in earnest with uh, Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI, which is often known as Star Wars, a nickname given to it because it employed many fantastical technologies that reminded people of Star Wars, including lasers. Um, 
there were two actually two ideas for lasers uh, in SDI. One of them was for a nuclear explosion powered satellite based laser called Project Excalibur, which would basically use the X-ray emissions from a nuclear detonation um, and focus them for use as a laser weapon. Because this idea is so out there and not really relevant to any current laser development, I'm not going to really discuss it, but Project Excalibur, you can look it up if that sounds interesting to you. Um, of more interest um, to current laser efforts was mid-infrared chemical laser, or Miracle, um, a megawatt class laser, so very powerful, actually more powerful than any of the current solid state lasers um, in development. So basically, the way Miracle worked as a chemical laser was that it ran off a sort of um, rocket engine-like chemical reaction. So basically, a fuel oxidizer combustion reaction, um, which used ethylene and nitrogen trifluoride to produce um, the correct energy in the correct wavelength that could then be channeled um, into a laser. So yeah, as a chemical laser, it used these chemicals in um, a fuel oxidizer reaction rather than using electricity stored in, for example, a battery. Um, it was very powerful laser, most powerful in the most powerful uh, weaponized laser of its type in the world for a very long time, and it was used in a variety of tests that kind of established the baseline for what a laser weapon could achieve, although it was extremely bulky and impractical. So here you can see this image shows what the inside um, of Miracle looked like. And as you can see, it's a huge network of, you know, of the fuel tanks, the oxidizer tanks, all sorts of um, pipes interconnecting them. And yeah, chemical lasers tend to be very large, very bulky, pretty dangerous to operate, and they burn through a large quantity of the various chemicals they use to produce their reactions. I forgot to mention that the goal of SDI was to shoot down Soviet intercontinental ballistic missiles, so it was a missile defense program. And SDI was eventually canceled, but the idea of using a megawatt class laser to shoot down ballistic missiles lived on um, and eventually came to fruition in a new demonstration called YAL-1. YAL-1 was also a megawatt class chemical laser, but this time it was mounted aboard a Boeing 747 rather than being a large static um, weapon. And as I mentioned earlier, it's quite difficult to intercept ballistic missiles, uh, the re-entry vehicle of the ballistic missile, which is basically the warhead, um, because it's heat-hardened, it travels so fast, it's really just not feasible. Um, instead, the idea behind YAL-1 was to shoot down the ballistic missiles as they boosted, so as they were attached to a rocket engine that carried them um, along their ballistic trajectory. So... YAL-1 did work. It was able to shoot down ballistic missiles in the boost phase. However, the problem was that it only really demonstrated the ability to intercept at ranges less than 50 miles. And even if it reached a maximum theoretical range of, you know, a couple hundred kilometers, let's say, um, that some studies indicated it might be able to shoot down missiles at that range, but even at that range, flying a Boeing 747 in circles, basically anticipating your enemy launching missiles is not a great solution. Um, the plane is so large, it's expensive, it's vulnerable, and the size of the chemical laser used um, in the YAL-1 demonstration basically meant that the laser could only be housed aboard an aircraft like the Boeing 747. So even though YAL-1 was impressive in terms of achieving a very high power output in a mobile laser, it was ultimately extremely expensive to develop and really didn't have any sort of battlefield utility. It was basically a dead end in terms of design. In addition to YAL-1, which was kind of the flagship effort in terms of the sheer power output achieved, there were some other smaller um, demonstrations undertaken, including a tactical high-energy laser, which was a very large ground-based chemical laser um, that demonstrated the ability to intercept um, some rocket artillery and mortar type projectiles at ranges of a couple kilometers 
And the advanced tactical laser, which was uh, approximately 100 kilowatt class laser, um, and also a chemical laser, mounted aboard a C-130 aircraft. And these uh, programs also showed them, you know, some amount of promise in demonstrations, but like YAL-1, were simply just too bulky, too inconvenient um, for use on the battlefield. And this is basically the story with all chemical lasers. Even though chemical lasers are able to achieve very high power outputs, the fact that, first of all, they're extremely large, um, because you need all the systems necessary to combine, you need the chemical storage tanks, you need, you know, the chamber in which the reaction can take place, all the, you know, various equipment to moderate the reaction, etc. It's just it's so many um, complex, large components that chemical lasers just end up being very large and heavy. And they're also relatively expensive to operate um, because you need to actually supply the chemicals, some of which are pretty, you know, they're not common chemicals um, for the laser reaction. In addition to the logistics that's involved in refueling the chemicals um, as they're depleted while the laser fires. And yeah, just especially the size, but a variety of considerations just meant that chemical lasers, which were the main avenue of development for a very long time, until recently, um, chemical lasers were just never going to really be a deployable battlefield weapon. And that's about it for discussion of laser development. Um, I'm glossing over a lot of stuff, including um, important work that was done by the Israelis and other countries, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on the U.S. side here. So now we get to current developments. And again, I'm only going to discuss the U.S. developments. If we got into every single country, this video would be hours long. Um, yeah, and another thing to say before we get into it is that I'm going to focus on power outputs in the discussion here. Um, power outputs are the thing that's reported in budgets, in the defense media, um, etc. And they're really the only thing that you can analyze with any sort of, you know, certainty. But that's not to say that power outputs are, you know, the most important thing or the only important thing that determines the performance of a laser. There are a lot of other really important aspects, including um, adaptive optics that allow you to compensate for atmospheric effects, including how tightly your uh, laser beam is focused, because a more tightly focused beam is going to be much more effective. The, the energy, as I said, is concentrated on a smaller area. And then also you have um, stuff like the stabilization of the laser. So the, the better your stabilization is, the more, you know, your laser will be able to basically hold um, its focus on a specific point rather than jumping around, and that means that you can transfer more of your energy to that one point that you're trying to burn through. And even other things such as artificial intelligence are important. For example, artificial intelligence could allow your laser to determine exactly how long it needs to shoot in order to defeat a target which could be extremely important because you don't want to waste any time on a target that's already been destroyed, and likewise you don't want to leave a target before it's actually been disabled. So these are all extremely important considerations, but there's just simply the level of um, information that's available in the public domain doesn't really allow you to analyze those in much detail. So what we're going to focus on is power outputs, which are of course important, but they're not the end-all be-all, I guess is the, um, the takeaway from that. So we're going to start by talking about the Missile Defense Agency, or the MDA. And as was the case with the uh, YAL-1, oftentimes the most um, advanced, the largest, the best funded, the most powerful laser development efforts are undertaken in the name of missile defense, because that's an obvious application of a high power laser. So this slide on the screen right now is um, taken from the Missile Defense Agency's FY20 budget request. And as you can see under the FY19 plans section, there are three different missile defense um, laser development paths that have been pursued. Um, one of these is diode pumped alkali laser, another is fiber combining laser, and the last is distributed gain laser. And each of these are a discrete type of laser that the MDA is developing in pursuit of their ultimate goal, which is to field something in the megawatt class that can attack missiles as they boost ballistic missiles specifically. So first, diode-pumped alkali laser. 
The diode pumped alkali laser, according to um, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and the Missile Defense Agency's own documents and websites, is based on the diode excitation of atomic alkali vapors. So basically, it's a cross between a gas and a solid state laser, since it uses a solid state diode as well as the alkali vapors, which are obviously a chemical component. Um, and this is one of the MDA's first high power laser avenues that was pursued and extensive developmental work has been undertaken at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And this image just shows um, a prototype of the diode pumped alkali laser. Of course, the final version, if it does make it into any sort of serial production, will be far more compact and whatnot. But oftentimes they build small scale prototypes. Basically, the Missile Defense Agency's approach for all these programs is to build a small tech demonstration for each type of technology and then basically try to achieve large gains in um, power to weight ratio by miniaturizing all the technologies they use. Anyways, the next technology we're going to talk about is the fiber combining laser. And fiber combining lasers have actually become quite popular in other programs not run by the MDA, so they'll crop up again. But basically this diagram on the, sh on the screen shows how a fiber combining laser works. It essentially combines multiple fiber lasers into one coherent beam, as the name would suggest. So as you can see, they share some components, all the different beams, such as a master oscill oscillator, um, detectors, etc. But the beams themselves are combined using optics um, to, to create basically one higher power beam, because individual fiber lasers cannot achieve the type of power necessary you know, to get into the megawatt range, per se. So in this image, you can see a small scale prototype of a fiber combining laser. And basically, um, you can see the multiple, you know, discrete individual fiber lasers that are all kind of tied together and working in parallel with each other. And lastly, there's the distributed gain laser. I don't have an image for this because honestly, there aren't really any images available in the open source. The distributed gain laser, based on what I've gathered, is a derivative of DARPA's HELADS, which was a solid state diode pumped laser with liquid cooling that was um, made as a demonstration in the um, 2000s, early 2010s. And I guess the MDA found the technology behind that compelling enough to add the DGL design based on the HELADS um, to, their, to their roadmap. But it's as you can see um, in the FY2019 plan section, the DGL hasn't even completed, hadn't even completed um, a concept design as of this budget's drafting. So it's a, bit, it's a bit behind the others and it's not really clear what exactly is going on with that component of the program. And there's been an RFI um, released recently which offers some interesting insight into what exactly what type of characteristics the MDA thinks a laser would need to be effective in the missile defense role they envision. And one of the specifications is a weight to power efficiency of two to four kilograms per kilowatt of uh, laser power. Just to give you an idea of the kind of miniaturization that would be required, that's um, you know far lower than any of the current systems are at. Although, you know, it could be feasible depending on how much miniaturization they're able to do. The time frame given is 2025 to 2026 at the earliest, although that's probably an optimistic time frame. And other interesting specifications include um, shot durations from 2 to 60 seconds. So that gives you an idea of the type of time they actually anticipate it taking to engage. Many people, you know, would imagine that since a laser travels at the speed of light, engagements would happen very quickly, but actually it takes a, a decent amount of time for the laser to burn through a challenging target at long range. So two to 60 seconds is, you know, quite, especially once you get in past 10, it's quite a long time to sustain such a high power shot. So definitely um, gives you an idea of the type of technical challenges involved in this sort of a project. And whether or not the MDA can get it by 2025 to 2026, it'll be interesting to see. Um, I think the type of platform they're envisioning for this sort of a laser weapon would probably either be some sort of a high altitude, long endurance UAV that could loiter above a likely launch position 
and basically shoot down missiles in boost phase. And there's also been some talk of putting lasers aboard satellites, although the satellite-based missile defense stuff always sparks heated debates among, you know, the physicists and the engineers who know more about the math than, you know, someone like me does. But um, there's there's been endless debates, and usually the MDA and the government are the ones saying it'll work, and everyone else's are the ones saying it won't work. But, you know, with space launch prices coming down dramatically, and if they're able to get massive improvements in laser miniaturization, then maybe something feasible could come out, out of that, although it seems like 2025 would be very optimistic for any sort of satellite-based um, laser capability. Probably a UAV would be more likely in the near term. Alright, now let's talk about the US Navy. I showed footage of LAWS before, which is a 35 kilowatt-ish later laser um, deployed aboard USS Ponce, which was, you know, used to melt some boats and UAVs and other less challenging targets. The Navy is going towards an actual real deployable laser weapon that would be, you know, serial produced to some small extent um, in the form of Helios, which is supposed to be a 60 kilowatt laser upon its introduction, upgradable to 150 kilowatts in the near term, and it's going to be placed on destroyers in the position where the close-in weapon system, the phalanx, used to be. And it includes an integrated dazzler, which makes it a sort of a combined, you know, warning deterrence weapon as well as an actual operational high-power laser. And with a power of eventually, in the near term, 150 kilowatts, should be pretty capable against U UAVs, maybe even, you know, slow-flying fixed-wing aircraft. But definitely 150 kilowatts is not enough to really provide a useful capability against a challenging target like an anti-ship cruise missile, at least not based upon the figures that are publicly available. And But one interesting aspect of, of Helios is that it is based on a fiber combining laser architecture like the MDA's fiber combining laser is, so that means the power should be pretty scalable with Helios, you know, as long as the power, you know, the storage and generation capability is there, there's no reason you couldn't just either increase the power of the fiber lasers or add more fiber lasers or whatever, and, you know, get more power out of the, the Helios without having to, you know, do a major overhaul of its systems, its targeting systems, etc. So there's the potential that Helios will grow to be maybe even, you know, a 500 kilowatt or even a megawatt type class system in decades, you know, if that's something they're able to achieve. And of course, the main question then is if the power generation capability is there, especially since some of the newer destroyers especially are operating pretty close to their power margins, especially since the ones with the new power-hungry radars like the AMDR. And that's one of the reasons why the Navy is eyeing its new large surface combatant, or LSC, which is supposed to have, you know, there's speculation that it might have some sort of a distributed, you know, integrated power architecture that would allow it to basically, you know, deliver much more power to systems such as a laser weapon, whereas the existing destroyers have a separate, you know, turbines for drive and then generators for their electrical power. With an integrated electric propulsion system, you can get an agile distribution of the power, and that's something that was used aboard the USS Zumwalt, so that might be featured aboard the new large surface competent as well. There's definitely interest in deploying something like a very high power laser, maybe like a very powerful variant of Helios aboard the new large surface competent. It's even in the RFI, um, in the LSC RFI, it, the vendors were asked about providing, you know, 360 degree laser coverage and all sorts of electrical power generation. So definitely the Navy envisions a future for lasers aboard surface warships and for, you know, using them for high end things, it appears to be a priority. But as is always the case, whether or not it actually materializes, you know, remains to be seen. And, you know, it'll depend to an extent on whether they can overcome the miniaturization challenges, the power delivery challenges, etc. Next, I'm going to talk about the U.S. Air Force. And the Air Force has a number of laser programs, but I'm just going to talk about one today because this video is already getting quite long. And that'll be SHIELD, which stands for Self-Protect High Energy Laser Demonstrator, which is a very forced acronym. Someone obviously spent a lot of time, you know, contorting that so that it would fit. But anyways, SHIELD, the power, um, the architecture of SHIELD, the type of laser it is, 
isn't even clear based on the existing documentation. There's really not much out in the open source about this project except for basic details on what it is. But the goal of Shield is to um, destroy, basically destroy incoming air-to-air -air missiles. And this is to me a really interesting application of laser technology because since since air-to-air -air missiles have been introduced, all the countermeasures have really relied on you know jamming on the agility of the you know the aircraft that's being targeted. Basically, they're all kind of soft kill. You could categorize them as soft kill countermeasures, and lasers would offer kind of the first true, real, practical hard kill solution to actually eliminate incoming air-to-air -air missiles and. If it's something that's successful and widely deployed, it could really change the dynamics surrounding how air-to-air -air missiles are used, um, what kinds of challenges they need to overcome, etc. So I think it's a really interesting prospect, but apparently there have been successful tests against air-to-air -air missiles using the prototype. And this is actually a pretty promising application of laser weapon technology for a number of reasons. First of all, air-to-air -air missiles are simply much more fragile than something like an anti-ship cruise missile, which often has, you know, a, which is has the ability to penetrate into a ship before it explodes and whatnot. You know, they're very large, sturdy missiles. Same with a ballistic missile, as you know, has to perform re-entry at high speeds. But something like an air-to-air -air missile is not nearly as robust. So the the type of laser you need to burn through it is much, you know, less powerful. And then the other major consideration is that, especially at high altitudes, there's just much less um, atmospheric debris in the air, there are fewer particles, so the likelihood that your laser beam is going to be you know, distorted and perturbed by the air itself is lower than an application like, say, a surface warship where you have to contend with a lot of humidity, a lot of turbulence, um, etc. Oh, and before I forget, just a quick note on this image. Um, I found it on the Air Force's website under the SHIELD press release. I'm not, I'm presuming it's some sort of, you know, a demonstrator, the SHIELD demonstrator, obviously a larger, a larger in size than the eventual product would be and housed in some sort of a rotating turret, which, you know, it wouldn't be if it was mounted aboard an aircraft. But anyways, um, that's about the only image I could find, so there you go. And initially, a, a weapon of this type would probably have to be deployed aboard some sort of an outboard, you know, a pod. But eventually, with a you know, with a sixth generation type uh, aircraft design, it could be even be integrated into the airframe itself. You know, of course, that would be pending. I'm sure that's one of the reasons that this demonstration is being carried out overall is to examine whether or not this is a feasible technology to incorporate aboard sixth generation plans. But yeah, there's the of course the challenge is the swap C requirements on especially something like a tactical aircraft. There's just not much free space. Every little bit of weight counts. So there's definitely that challenge there. Although it's probably outweighed, you know, roughly by the lesser power that you can use in that application. But yeah, I just think this this is a really really interesting use of um, lasers perhaps even like one of the most likely to make a major difference on the way warfare is conducted. If you could shoot down incoming air-to-air -air missiles with a pretty good certainty and you could put this sort of a weapon aboard a tactical aircraft, that would seriously, seriously change all the calculations that underlie, you know, beyond visual range air-to-air -air combat. So I think this is a really interesting technology and it'll be, you know, definitely something to watch going forward. And lastly, let's talk a bit about the Army. The Army's been doing laser developments for quite a while. They've put a lot of stuff on trucks. They've done a lot of ground-based things. Um, the Army's mostly interested in lasers for air defense and for counter-drone and counter-rocket and mortar duties. So in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, many U.S. bases were constantly being shot at with mortars and other, you know, crude rockets, etc. Israel also has this... Um, also faces this type of a threat with a lot of, you know, very high frequency. There's constantly being rocket attacks carried out, etc. So there's been a lot of interest in the ground-based forces on sort of a portable, cheap weapon that can consistently engage these less challenging targets like, you know, mortar rounds, etc. And it's a duty that's usually been, you know, assigned to something like a C-RAM counter-rocket and mortar, 
unit, which is basically a phalanx Sea Whiz that's mounted aboard a truck bed. And these things are, they're not, you know, close in weapon systems have never operated with 100% certainty. They basically just throw up a wall of lead at whatever is coming and hope that something hits. So obviously, a laser weapon, you know, maybe 50 kilowatts, 100 kilowatts that can deal with these sort of targets is extremely attractive to the army. And that's kind of where their developmental efforts have gone so far. And one of these is a program which doesn't appear to have an actual acronym or a name yet, but it's being handled by the Rapid Capabilities Office, is aiming to field a 50 kilowatt laser aboard a striker. And this is being handled by Northrop Grumman. Um, I'm not sure exactly what type of laser it is. I suspect it's probably a fiber combining laser. But, yeah, 50 kilowatts should definitely provide good counter-drone capability, maybe some counter-rocket and mortar on the lower end. And they're, they're aiming to get this um, fielded pretty soon, I think. So that should be an interesting, yeah, by 2023 is what the uh, Defense News article says. So pretty, pretty um, rapid timeline on that one. And then there's also another program called um, HEL TVD, High Energy Laser Tactical Vehicle Demonstrator which is higher power, it's 100 kilowatts, but that's going to be mounted aboard um, an FMTV truck. So a medium-sized um, truck. And that's also by 2022. That system is going to combine a battery and an engine, a generator, um, and a battery system that's produced by Rolls-Royce as kind of an integrated laser power solution. So yeah, the 100 kilowatt would probably be better suited to, to like a static CRAM application where it's put at a base um, to shoot down incoming rounds and, or something of that sort. Anyways, that about does it for this video. I hope you've um, learned a bit um, about what each type of service wants from their laser programs, what kinds of developmental efforts they're currently undertaking, and also the typical uses of lasers, you know, counter air, counter munition, counter boat, there are many realms in which we don't really see lasers being a factor in the near future, including, of course, counter armor, um, counter large surface vessels, etc. But also, you know, the challenges that, that laser development poses. Of course, we saw in the early section of the video, there are many, many difficulties still that remain to be overcome. And there are endless debates in the open source, you know, on forums, websites, etc. over whether lasers will, could ever be a feasible weapon. Many people have extremely passionate opinions. Some of them have more of a background in engineering and physics than others. Especially um, if you check the comments of any website like Breaking Defense or the Naval Institute News, you can see this debate play out repeatedly on every single article that mentions lasers. And you know, of course, the military is doing a lot of things that they don't tell us about, so it's kind of hard to assess exactly how far along they are in some instances, and, you know, they may be exploring avenues that overcome some of the problems that just we can't really assess in the open source, so it's kind of hard to say exactly how successful laser development will be from the outside, but definitely there's a lot of optimism, and there's a lot of pessimism, and, you know, as is always the case with breaking, you know, cutting-edge technologies, it really just remains to be seen whether these challenges can be overcome and li whether lasers can be operationally deployed, but a few realms, including missile defense, um, self-defense of aircraft, counter munitions, and, you know, defense of Navy battle fleets, etc., could really be revolutionized if the most optimistic predictions about lasers come true. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll be posting some links to articles in the description below, as well as a link to my website where I have, you know, articles on similar topics, mostly military technology. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time.